<laughs> As president, I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, Lee Exton. Lee is the leading authority on the history of French Victorian carriage clock makers and their clocks. His focus being on the Jacob and Drocourt families and their associates. His in-depth research has utilised previously unknown source material obtained by visiting the Parisian archives. Lee has held major exhibits of both Henry Jacourt, that was in 2013, and Drocourt in 2014, with published exhibition catalogues containing new information on the clocks and their manufacture whilst debunking several previous health views. He has also researched and published findings on the well-known French clockmaking town of Saint Nicolas d'Alemont, probably the most important area in the history of French carriage clock industry. Lee is a, li a livery man of the Worship Company of Clockmakers, as well as a director of NAWCC, Chapter 195. He also has the position as a consultant at the UK auction house of Bins, Hampton and Littlewood. Today's, uh, Lee, today, Lee's illustrated talk is about the great carriage clock making father and son partnership, Pierre and Alfred Drocourt. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Lee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, Yes, today um, I'm going to do a talk that's possibly in sort of two parts. Uh, there's a little summary of my work on um, Pierre and Alfred Drocourt, uh, just to sort of give a, a, an outlying view, because mainly I've, I've brought across two clocks from my own collection, which are here on the table, uh, that I'm hoping will be of interest uh, to you all. They're two exceptional clocks. Um, as you'll find out when we get to that part of the talk, this was a clock given by Queen Victoria to her favoured godson, Victor Bidolf. And this is a clock that I purchased and knew very little about, but undertook six or seven months of research, uh, talking to the family of the owner. And this clock I ended up working out was actually a wedding present to Alice Little, who of course was Alice in Wonderland. But to kick off, a little bit about the maker of those two clocks. They were both made by Alfred Drocourt. Pierre Drocourt was born in Garganville in 1819, the, the father of Alfred. Uh, and this is a small town 30 miles away from Paris. There is no reason that he should have any interest in clock making whatsoever. It was farming land. Um, and uh, his whole family were, were, were cultivators. But he did live close to Julien Jacot, who in 1820, <coughs> excuse me, alongside his brother Henry, uh, came to um, Paris from uh, Switzerland and founded one of the great carriage clock making dynasties in Paris, Henri Jacot. And in this photograph, uh, in the uh, foreground is Garganville. Uh, and in the background is uh, Guitrancourt, where Jaco lived. So the families must have um, met up. There's no other reason that Pierre Drogue or a farmer would suddenly get into uh, clock making, and especially carriage clock making. Uh, he must have uh, had uh, some reason to, and it has to be because he lives so close to uh, one of the Jaco family. Pierre Drogue moved to Paris as an apprentice in Sir Great 1836. Uh, he worked um, across the road at uh, Rengo Frere, uh, where he, as I say, did his apprenticeship. And he lived at Rue saint Tong 8, which is now number 38, where he married Maria del Van Del. And this is where their son, Alfred Drocourt, was born in October 1847. This is previously unknown uh, news. <coughs> Excuse me, so when I was in Paris, I'll go back there, and I 
found number 38, and I was the first person, I believe, to realise that Alfred Drocor lived, uh, was born and lived behind there. I phoned up my wife, and um, <clears throat> I was standing in front of the door, and I said to her, um, Bianca, I am here, standing in front of number 38, previously number 8, Rue saint Tong. I said, I could be the only person in the world who realises this is where Alfred Drocourt, the great Alfred Drocourt, was born. There was a bit of a silence, and I got, you very well could be. <laughs> now I must go. I've got to go and collect the boys from school. So I thought, <laughs> fair enough. I started walking away and suddenly thought, why would she be collecting the boys from school at 11.30 in the morning? <laughs> so she perhaps doesn't share my enthusiasm. So there we had uh, Alfred Drocourt born in 1847. Pierre then opened his own business at uh, 3 Couture Saint Gervais in 1852, where the pink dot is. Um, unfortunately, that's now been knocked down. Uh, the, the hotel, the cameras behind, uh, is still there, and that's where the Picasso exhibition is. Um, but Coutre Saint Gervais is gone, it's now a park. Uh, where the blue dot is, is where Rango Frere also moved to. So, strangely enough, Rango and Drocourt moved at a very similar time. And where the A is, just here, is now a wonderful little pub cafe that I spent a fair bit of time reviewing my notes in. <laughs> so, Drocourt then moved to uh, Rue Limoges, number 8, in 1855. So he set up his business. He's been going for four or five years making carriage clocks. The road name changed to Rue des Blim, and number 28 in 1865 because they expanded all the roads. They just changed how the whole of Paris was going to be laid out. And to the right there where you can see a lamp where the building juts out. That was uh, Drocourt's uh, workshops. And if you look down Rue de Blin, you can see a slanted roof uh, which goes in a, a, almost a, a, an inverted V. And that is actually uh, number 38 Rue Saint-Ong where he was born. So he moved, uh, Alfred uh, moved from his birthplace a short way away and then back to within a short uh, distance from where he was first born. Now, his father, Pierre, retired um, uh, in 1872, and Alfred took on the business, and he did so with a lot of enthusiasm. He decided to turn it from a relatively small uh, clockmaking, carriage clockmaking concern into uh, something uh, a little bit more commercial, copying, in a way, uh, uh, Albert Jaco had taken over the business of uh, his uncle Henri Jaco. They were in competition with each other. So, uh, so, so um, Alfred Drocourt decided he was going to really get involved in the Paris uh, clockmaking industry uh, and fraternity. And this is uh, just to give an idea of what he, how he got involved. This is the uh, Exposition Universelle of uh, 1900. This is the jury for class. 96, which is the horological class. Uh, someone sent me this um, picture and said, don't worry, on the back it's got the names of everybody who's in the picture. When I turned it around, they were just all over the place. And it took, uh, it took a day or so to work out that Alfred Drocourt is the one with the moustache on the back row looking to his left in the centre there next to the taller, taller chap. So this is the first time that, um, using this, that we've been able to identify how or, or what Alfred uh, Drocor looked like. Using that, we know that he became a part of the um, School of Horology in Paris, uh, along with Rodonnet, who was the founder. In fact, uh, uh, Rodonnet is the uh, chap sitting in the front there, in the middle, uh, on the chair. So he was, he was a very special... Uh, Parisian horologist, as I'm sure you know, but uh, we don't want to deviate too much. So, <clears throat> Alfred Drocourt started and helped to start the uh, uh, school, the Ecole of Clockmaking. Um, and I've got this wonderful photograph of one of the classes. Uh, I've had this photograph for some years, 
Uh, and it was only when I blew it up and looked at it and compared it to that previous photograph that I realised that that's Alfred Drocor himself in the doorway. So he's gone in and he's overseeing a class or probably sort of just going in to have his photograph taken with the class. So we now know that that's Alfred Drocourt. So if anybody has got this, this image of, uh, of uh, the class at the, the, the Ecole, you know that that is Alfred Drocourt himself who's uh, in the doorway. So Drocourt as makers and suppliers. We know that uh, Alfred wants to increase production uh, and he'd been supplied by Hollinge Frere. Hollinge Frere are a little known um, carriage clock making family. When I say little known, every one of you who's had a carriage clock or three will have probably had a movement by Hollinge Frere. Uh, they had their workshop situated in um, the uh, horological town of St Nicholas d'Herlimont, which was up in the north of uh, France uh, near Dieppe. And as I say, they were, they were unheralded makers, but they had been making carriage clocks from the early period of carriage clock production. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Hollinge was working uh, with, with Garnier uh, in, the, in the 1820s, um, but unfortunately nobody's done much research on them, or hadn't done until uh, my obsession kicked in. So Jean-Baptiste Hollinge was in the 19, 1820s, and he had two sons, Jean-Baptiste and Louise, Louis, and these two joined forces in the, in the, in the 1840s to become Hollinge Frere. Hollinge, or the brothers, used a stamp on the front freight of their clocks, and this was the initials HL. Now, I haven't got time to explain how I know that this is Hollinge Frere, but this is Hollinge Frere. Nobody um, has come up with the with the explanation. In, in Alex says it could be Henry Le Pau. Others have said it could be Henry Le Pen. It is definitely Hollinge Frere, the stamp for Hollinge Frere. Um, it's quite likely that before the two brothers got together, Louis had this stamp made, and it is, it's for um, uh, Louis. But it is definitely, definitely the Hollinge Frere stamp. <coughs> so Hollinge Frere were clockmakers who supplied a number of, uh, of the big makers, and as we'll see, that they, they are interlinked with Drocor because in 1875, Drocor, who had been supplied by them, came and, and bought their workshops. Just as, to give you an idea, this is the, uh, the main street in St. Nicholas d'Herlimont, and it's quite a lovely photograph. On the right is the gateway to Coulet Frere. Uh, down the end there, uh, or behind us, uh, we've got Delapine. Uh, on the left, we've got the other Coulet uh, house. And just beyond that, on the left, is a lovely picture of a window showing why and how they built their houses to allow in the light so that the clockmakers could work. So if you can see that window on the left-hand side, the whole of St Nicholas d'Herlimont, if you go there, although unfortunately they're knocking some of it down now, but if you go there today, you can go down back streets, down back alleys, and thousands and thousands of workers over the uh, 1800s worked there in the clockmaking industry and there's still little roads that you can go down with windows like this and little areas where it was obvious there were uh, clockmakers. So we know that Hollinge supplied many of the eminent makers. He supplied Paul Garnier. This is a Garnier, um, uh, so that's a Garnier carriage clock. That one's number 2659, and that's got an HL stamp movement number 2633. He supplied Bordan, Athenay's Bordan. This is a Bordan clock number 4469 that's got an HL movement 5527. And they supplied Bolvier. And this is a wonderful Bolvier clock with an HL movement uh, with, um, with a fantastic escapement. He also... <coughs> Uh, supplied Georges Moser, or Moser as, as his movements are stamped. And I'm sure many of you who've got, uh, who've got clocks from the 1850s, 1860s will have a clock which has got Moser stamped on. And of course, he supplied the Drocourt family. Now, Alfred Drocourt, when he started in 1852, when he had finished his apprenticeship and opened his first uh, um, magazine, his first showroom or, or shop, uh, was supplying inkwell clocks which were a bit of a rage at this point. And there were only two people supplying inkwell clocks, and that was 
Trocor, and Moser. And just to sort of go off tangent slightly, this is an example of an inkwell clock of the style advertised by Drocor, but signed for George Moser. And this shows the relationship between the various makers at the time. This is the movement from the inkwell clock. So it's signed Moser down below the bell, uh, Moser Paris, and it's got his serial number on it. There's the front plate of that movement, HL, Holland Schreer, remembering that these were clocks that Drocor retailed or sold on behalf of Moser. But the most interesting part of this is uh, of this movement from the inkwell clock, and I know this is an 1850 clock because the mainspring is dated and, and signed by Borel, who made for Garnier, was Garnier's mainspring maker. The lovely thing about this is it's got a shaft cutter escapement. Uh, as we see on clocks by Paul Garnier. So it shows how they were all interacting and working together. In fact, Hollinge made uh, the most of the shaft cutter escapement uh, movements I've seen for Garnier were made by, by Hollinge Frere. So through piecing together various sources of information, I've got land sales, particular census records. I just went through everything they had at St. Nicholas Daly Mont over uh, a number of years, um, I finally located the position of Drocor's house and workshops, which would have previously been the Hollinge uh, house. He had just built new workshops, and his manager, Auguste Le Chevalier, who he brought in from Paris, lived and worked there <coughs> from 1875 up until 1904. And this is where the carriage clocks emanated from. This is an aerial view from the other end of St. Nicholas d'Aliamont from the postcard we saw earlier and you probably can't see so if we blow it up that oval shows on the right hand side his house and on the left hand side uh, typical workshop roofs. Uh, this postcard is from the 1910s uh, and according to the sales particulars, when Drocor sold this premises, this property, uh, he'd only had those built, been built for about 20 years. Um, the lovely thing is that if you go there, and this was a great surprise to me, still there. Uh, it's now a car workshop. So there is Drocor's house that the Chevalier lived in, and there is the workshops where anybody who has, I would say, a Drocourt carriage clock from 1880 onwards, that's where it was put together and made. And I just thought that was, I can't explain the excitement when I realised that I'd found Drocourt's workshops. So we know he was on the jury of the 1900 um, exposition. This was his stand there. Uh, I found this in um, uh, one of the review uh, chronometrics. Uh, but as a member of the committee, he was unable to uh, be given a medal, but he did get the mention honorable. Now, very quickly, uh, I have to tell this story. I bought a giant Grand Sonnery Drocourt carriage clock of somebody who, a very elderly gentleman, uh, 10 years ago, who had been a friend of Drocourt's supplier uh, um, and Morris Pitcher, uh, his father. And he said to me, this clock was Drocourt's own clock. And I said, OK, I took it with a pinch of salt. You know, here's this one clock of 30 odd thousand. Why would this be Drocourt's own clock? But this chap had been friends with, with, with Drocor's supplier. So uh, I uh, had the clock there, obviously, found the picture, blew the picture up, and realised that the clock I had in front of me was that one there. So I've got to, at home, the, which is a great thing to have. I've got the clock um, that was at the, uh, at, at the exposition of 1900, and that has since been verified um, by by this uh, friend of mine through uh, some uh, paperwork he's got. So, in 1904, Alfred Drocourt moved from his Paris premises at 28 Rue d'Ebeline, 
and he placed the St. Nicholas House and Workshops, as we saw, on the market. They didn't sell for two years. I've got all the solicitor, the attorneys, or solicitors, attorneys, letters, and he was getting very frustrated at not being able to sell. And I think probably the reason his, the reason he was retiring, his carriage clock making was slowing down there, and people didn't want to buy a workshop. I've also found this wonderful photograph of Alfred Drokel's house on the quay. It's the uh, wooden uh, plastered house there, and. Going through all the uh, notary's letters, I came across the sales particulars in 1904 for this house as well. And it was quite wonderful because he'd sold it to Edward Brown, who was the owner of Breguet. And so Edward moved there with his sister Madeleine until Madeleine got married. And that is where Edward retired to. It's a shame, Rangiport, part of Garganville, where this is, has been near enough raised to the ground and you know the only property still standing is Drocor's house. So if you want to get there and have a look, there's the place to get there quick, get there quick. So that is his actual house that he lived in. So Alfred Drocor, sort of going on to part two of the talk here, Alfred Drocor supplied many of the top London and American retailers. He's taken on um, the Hollinge uh, book, uh, and they were supplying some of the top makers. And through these uh, retailers, clocks made by Drocourt found their way to some of the most distinguished families, some of the high-end families in, in, in Britain and the world. Um, one that was purchased by Queen Victoria, which is this one, this one here, and one that was given to uh, Alice Liddell, the, the inspiration for Alice in Wonderland, which is this one there. <clears throat> Both clocks as they are, are here today and have absolutely fascinating stories to tell. In 1877, Queen Victoria gifted the Grand Sonnery uh, gorge there uh, to her favoured godson, Victor Biddulph, and this was to commemorate his confirmation on the 30th of March of that year. And this is Victor Biddulph. As we can see, he was the son of Sir Thomas Biddulph. And there is the clock. And there down the bottom is the engraving to Victor Biddulph from his godmother, Victor godmother Victoria R on his confirmation, March 30th, 1877. There underneath, is a label. Not only has it got Drokel's serial number on it, it's got Victor's label, ownership label. So Victor Bidolf, who was given this clock, who was he? Well, he was born in St George's, Hanover Square in London in uh, April 1860. He was the son, as we saw, of General Sir Thomas Middleton Bidolf and Mary Frederica Seymour. Mary had been the maid of honour to Queen Victoria, and when uh, she and Sir Thomas got married, became an honorary Lady of the Bedchamber, uh, and this was in 1857. And here we've got a picture of Sir Thomas, the father of Victor, on the left there, leaning slightly forward um, with, with Queen Victoria, who's turned her back on him uh, there, second from the left. So, um, now, Sir Thomas, held the position of Keeper of the Privy Purse. So he looked after the financial affairs of, of Queen Victoria and indeed the royal household. Now he died in September 1878 at the mains of Abigail, or Abigeldi, which bordered Balmoral Castle, the Queen's residence. She actually stayed up at Balmoral during his illness to make sure she was close to him. This is how close the families were and she would visit him every day. Now, I've got this wonderful letter here from Prince Leopold. This is the actual letter on Balmoral letter-headed paper, signed by Leopold himself, the, the son of Queen Victoria. <clears throat> and this is addressed to my dear Ponsonby. The Queen is rather angry at the enclosed letter. We don't need to go into why she was angry, but boy, was she angry. <laughs> at the end of it, there's a lovely little 
paragraph. But just remember the name Ponsonby, because he comes back into the story later. At the end of the letter from Leopold to Ponsonby, Leopold writes, we are almost, we are most sad and anxious about dear Sir Thomas, who I fear is dying. Yours very truly, Leopold. So Ponsonby, who the letter's written to, Leopold, the Queen, um, and Bidolf are all within a circle of friends. Of course, Sir Thomas Bidolf did actually die a few days later, and the Queen was, was, was grief-stricken. So much so that she erected, a memory, in his memory, a drinking fountain uh, on the Balmoral Estate. She also uh, granted Lady Bidolf, Victor's mother, uh, rooms within the Henry III's tower at Windsor Castle, uh, where she died in October 1902. Uh, what's lovely about this is I've, uh, I've done a lot of work on the census records, and Victor uh, was living there with her at the time, and so we know that that clock spent time in Windsor Castle um, during its lifetime with Victor. So Victor Bidolf, the recipient of this clock, he's seen here, again to show you the closeness between all the families, he's seen here seated opposite Princess Beatrice and the rest of the cast of the play What's Up? Uh, this is at um, uh, Balmoral Castle where he played the lawyer Fennel, written by the Irish playwright uh, Dion uh, Bukakil, and it was performed in the ballroom there in October 1889. And this was part of the 31st birthday celebrations for Prince Henry of Battenberg. Queen Victoria commented in her diary that the music was perfectly disgraceful, <laughs> but found the second act of the play very amusing and exciting. So this shows how Victor Bidolf uh, was very much a part of, of the court uh, of, of, of Queen Victoria. Victor Bidolf died 13th of February 1919, with his will proven in the following months. It stated that he left the majority of his possessions to his spinster sister, Frederica Mary Bidolf. But what of the clock itself? There's no mention of the clock in his will. Well, when I opened the case, I pulled it open, looked inside, pulled out the front piece, tucked in there was a piece of paper, which is that. This was tucked inside Victor Bidolf's clock in the case. Dated December 1928, <clears throat> it is typed on War Office headed paper. This is going to sound a little confusing. The letter states, forwarded with the compliments of General Sir Walter Braithwaite, by whom it was received from Lady Haig, with a request that it should be forwarded to Major General Sir John Ponsonby. So the Ponsonby name comes up again. So following Haig's death in January 1928, his widow, Lady Dorothy Haig, is attempting to get this clock delivered to Sir John Ponsonby. And of course, this is the Ponsonby uh, whose father was mentioned previously in Prince Leopold's letter. So this was wonderful. This gives me a little bit more history. We know where it was up to a certain point, up to Windsor Castle. It seems to suggest that somehow the great uh, Douglas Haig, the first Earl of Haig, actually owned the clock. And his wife, after his death, is trying to return it perhaps to the royal household. Now, so we're now on to Sir John Ponsonby, who now receives the clock. Sir John was the son of the late Major General Sir Henry Ponsonby, who had the letter from Prince Leopold, and who was Queen Victoria's private secretary, Sir John uh, Ponsonby, and was Prince Albert's equerry. And he is actually portrayed by Geoffrey Palmer in the film Mrs. Brown. And uh, as we say it was the my dear Ponsonby who received that letter and it was Sir Henry who succeeded Victor's father Sir Thomas Bidolf as keeper of the privy purse in 1878. So as with Victor's mother so it was that Sir John's mother 
Mary Ponsonby, was also a maid of honour to the Queen. So it's come full circle. And here is a wonderful uh, photograph showing the close relationships between the Bidolf family, Victor's father, and the Ponsonby families. Uh, Ponsonby families, uh, John's father. And here we have Sir, Ho Sir Henry Ponsonby, father of the last known recipient of the clock, seated there on the far left, next to Sir Thomas Bidolph in the top hat, father of the first recipient of the clock, shortly before uh, the latter's death in 1878. So, if as requested by Lady Haig, the clock was delivered to Sir John Ponsonby, it's come full circle. <coughs> Excuse me. It's come from the son of the Queen's keeper of the previous purse, to the son of his successor in that role. Now, that Prince Leopold was close to Victor Biddle's father is most interesting, as the prince was also a very close friend of Alice Liddell's. In fact, it's rumoured that he did ask for her hand in marriage and was turned down. And of course, we know Alice Liddell is the inspiration for Charles Dodgson's Alice in Wonderland or Lewis Carroll, as he's known as, uh, uh, as an author. So Alice Liddell, the inspiration for Charles Dodgson's uh, Alice in Wonderland. And she was the recipient of the other clock shown here. It is a clock that my research, I feel, has given it as an equally fascinating story as that of the one that owned by Queen Victoria. So Alice in Wonderland. <coughs> in 2021, I purchased this carriage clock from Mary Jean Sinclair. Um, and she was the granddaughter of Alice Liddell, uh, who uh, became Alice Hargreaves, and as we know, was Lewis Carroll's inspiration. It's made in Paris by Alfred Drocourt. Uh, it's made of silvered brass. It's got panelled sides. But what is so fascinating is that the engraved decoration to the dial panels and case depict riverside scenes. Uh, these are reeds, insects, flower heads, and they're all very reminiscent in the manner of the images shown in the early copies of Alice in Wonderland and actually Alice Through the Looking Glass as, draw as drawn by John Tenniel. So these engraved with riverbank scenes would have been the view that Alice and her sisters saw as they went down the River Isis uh, with Lewis Carroll in, in 1862 in the summer as he told them stories of Alice's fanciful adventures, stories that became obviously the basis of his famous books. Uh, the, the, the important part of the story is the clock is complete with its numbered Moroccan leather travelling box. <coughs> so here we have it, Alice Liddell's clock. But was it Alice Liddell's clock? I bought it with the provenance stating that it was Alice Liddell's clock. And here we have a close-up of the view of the dial and the both side panels. Although not exact, we do get an idea of the inspiration for the engraving on this, because these are John Tenniel's original engravings for Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass. Um, it, basically, we're looking at the reeds and the flora, how that's been copied all the way through into the panels of the clock. Now the serial number on this clock movement, 17647, through my research into Drocourt, I, dated, I could date it to 1879 to 1880, which is intriguing because I've had some correspondence sent to me, here we go, after I got in contact with Alice's granddaughter, Mary Jean Sinclair, she sent me this lovely letter bit coffee stained, she's rubbed out her old address, but it says, I received the clock on my father's death as his only child. He inherited it from Alice as his only child. So there we have the full provenance from when the clock was bought from Drocourt or from J.W. Benson until when I got it. It's gone from, her, from Alice in Wonderland to Carol, her son, and to Carol's daughter, Mary Jean, from whom I bought it. And that is quite a precious letter, that one. That Not only that, but Vanessa, Mary Jean's daughter, 
put in another letter, really apologising <coughs> for the state of the coffee stains. And this is the letter I received from Vanessa Tate, who was um, Alice in Wonderland's great-granddaughter. Dear Lee, here is my mother's note. I am afraid it is not the most legible, or printed on the clearest of paper, neither is mine. And this is the next important part in the story. My mother thinks the clock was probably a wedding present to Alice, but we don't know from whom. Best, Vanessa. <coughs> so, we've got a story developing here about this clock. We know who owned it, and we know where it was, and we now think it was a wedding present. When I examined the clock closely, I found underneath the most wonderful faint signature, Mrs. Hargreaves, in ink. You can't see much of it there, but pro I promise you, when you look at it, it's there, Mrs. Hargreaves. This shows it a bit in a larger format. So there's a distinctive H, there's a distinctive A, there's a distinctive, you can't quite see, a distinctive G. So is this Alice in Wonderland's signature on the bottom of the clock? I mean, how wonderful would it be if it was? And if so, has she signed it Mrs. Hargreaves because she's received it as a wedding present? Why not Alice Hargreaves? Why not Alice Little? Why Mrs. Hargreaves? Sometime after I bought the clock, I bought an album which was put together by Ada Karali Mead Waldo, and she was a member of the, an Edwardian society family. I couldn't bring it with me. It's this by this by this. It's massive. And in this album, um, Ada goes all over the southeast of England to all the best homes and all the big country homes, and she was a real socialite. But to every place she went, she collected signatures, and she collected photographs, and she collected uh, ephemera. There, would be, there was a cricket match, for instance, played, and she put uh, the, the score sheet of the cricket match in this album. And she was doing this between 1902 and 1907. And what's so lovely is on one page here, she visited the Hargreaves family at Cuffnells, where they lived at Lyndhurst. This was after um, Alice married um, uh, Reginald Hargreaves and they had their son, Carol. So there we have Alice Pleasant Hargreaves. We also have Carol Hargreaves. So we've got both signatures of the two first owners of the clock. When we blow it up, the distinctive H, the distinctive A, and the distinctive G are all there. And so I think we can confirm that Alice herself signed the bottom of that clock probably on her wedding day or there or thereabouts. So that's further confirmation of the ownership. <coughs> Mary, the granddaughter, as we know, has confirmed the clock was passed on to Alice's son, Carol, following Alice's death in 1934, and it would have been with him in his home, Broadwood House in Ascot. And I know by the census records that Carol Hargreaves, he lived in Broadwood House in Ascot, which is lovely. So if we go back, how long did his daughter hold on to letter-headed paper, Broadwood House, Sunningdale? She sent me this letter 80 years or 70 years after Carol sold that house, and she still has letter-headed. And to me, that was just wonderful. The fact that uh, that, that came on that was just an added bonus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <coughs> So Carol passed it on to Mary Jean Hargreaves, who we know is Alice, uh, Alice Little's um, granddaughter, <clears throat> on his death in 1955. Now this is where it gets really interesting because Mary Jean married the MP Malcolm Sinclair. He was the Member of Parliament for Bristol South East. And they lived in a large country house, Upton House, situated near Tetbury in Gloucestershire. Vanessa sent me an email stating that my mother has written a short note for you confirming that the clock belonged to Alice and after that Carol 
as we have there. And she also said, it would have moved with him when he moved house, and after that was kept at Upton in its case. So I thought, Upton in its case. Did they have a case? Did they have Upton in its case? In researching Upton House, <coughs> I came across a, co a copy of the Country Life magazine, a society magazine uh, in the UK, and it was dated the 15th of February 1973. I managed to get hold of a copy of this Country Life, please excuse the spelling mistake as well, um, a copy of the Country Life, and this Country Life magazine was brought out when Malcolm and Mary St. Jean Sinclair were living there. There is the title page of the article. So that's Upton House in Tetbury in Gloucestershire. And inside, various photographs of the home. There's a picture of the living room <coughs> with the fireplace. <coughs> Excuse me. And there, we can see the clock in its case. That's the case that she meant. She meant that case. That is the case that's sitting there on the piece of furniture. And if you look to the right, you can even see the way it's sitting with the strap slightly at an angle. So there we have Alice's clock at Upton House in the 1970s. So the story carries, carries forward. There we go. There it is in its box, and there is the box itself. In a letter sent to me by Vanessa, as I s stated, it said her mother believes the clock was given to Alice as a wedding present, but she was unsure who. So this was my next quest. I can't tell you how pleased my wife was that I disappeared for hours and hours and hours on end. I wanted to find out who may have originally given Alice Little, who became Alice Hargreaves when she married Reginald, who gave Alice in Wonderland this clock as a wedding present. And this led me down to some research that uh, uh, I was very lucky that um, Mark Davis of the Lewis Carroll Society uh, suggested to me that in one of the Oxford uh, newspapers, uh, the, the Oxford, um, uh, I forget which one it was now, that there would be a uh, write-up of her marriage as her husband was the uh, Dean of Christchurch, Oxford, a, a very high prominent position in that rarefied world at Oxford University. And of course he would have come across uh, Charles Dodge and Lewis Carroll. And it seemed likely that that wedding uh, would be noted in one of those newspapers. So I followed Mark Davis's uh, uh, intuition, <coughs> went through all the archives at Oxford in London, and came up with, in this newspaper, a wonderful description of the wedding itself, which, as we said, due to Henry Liddell standing in the church, was actually held in Westminster Cathedral. So Alice Liddell, Alice in Wonderland, got married in Westminster Cathedral, the home of the coronations, royal weddings and state funerals. And here we have a description of her wedding. Now the most wonderful thing here, it says, Miss Alice Pleasant Liddell, the bride, second daughter of the de dean, uh, etc. The bridegroom is Reginald uh, Jervis Hargreaves and of Cuffnells in Lyndhurst, where uh, we had the, um, we saw earlier in Hampshire. But the lovely thing about this, at the bottom was a list of all the wedding gifts given to the couple, including uh, a gift from Prince Leopold, which was rather lovely. It was a, a, a horseshoe brooch, which she wore. And, um, it, although that was not the, <laughs> the, the present we're, we're looking for. But what was lovely is there in the middle, Mr. Alfred Penn, handsome engraved travelling clock. I don't think we can say otherwise than that is the handsome engraved travelling clock that Alfred Penn gave Alice Hargreaves as a wedding present. 
So how did Penn and the Hargreaves family know each other? Well, Reginald, Alice's husband, was a very well-known and very good cricketer, first-class cricketer. And in June 1875, uh, he'd made his first-class cricket debut for Hampshire against Kent uh, in Catford. Uh, strangely enough, I lived just 100 years, 100 years, 100 yards away from that, the site of that cricket ground and didn't know the significance of it at the time. Um, he came up against Frank Penn, who was the famous Kent batsman who had a short but very brilliant career, ranking for several years among the finest batsmen of the day. Now, Frank, who Reginald uh, came up against, had three brothers, including Alfred, Dick, Penn, another county cricketer for Kent, who made his debut in July 1875 against Sussex at Hove. A third brother, William Penn, also played for Kent. Um, for those of you who know cricket well and know the southeast of England well, you'll know if these people, these, these uh, men all played for Sussex, Kent at this time, they would have all known each other. They were all uh, in the same social circles. So the fact that Reginald might have played for Hampshire and that uh, Alfred Penn played for uh, Kent would be irrelevant. They would all know each other very well. They'd all be mixing in the same social circles. So the clock came from a friend of Reginald Hargreaves, um, the cricketer Penn. In six, uh, November the 16th, 1934, uh, Alice Hargreaves died. She died in a house in Westerham in Kent because she suffered from quite bad asthma. And the home in Cuffnells that they lived in in Lindhurst was a massive home, full of damp, full of mould, and it really caused her a lot of problems. So she bought this wonderful home in the High Street in Westerham in Kent. Uh, in fact, if anyone's been to Westerham, they will have seen the house because you can't miss it as you go through. <coughs> Interestingly, another little sideline here, 30 years ago, I worked for, uh, or I worked alongside Derek Roberts, a very uh, well-known and uh, superb dealer in clocks, and uh, he had a great interest in carriage clocks. And I sold a, uh, we sold a clock to uh, a customer in Westerham, and it was only when I went back over my records, I realised that I had delivered that clock, and I had delivered that clock to the house that Alice died in, and just purely by coincidence. So, we know the three owners of the clock after Drocor made it, or finished it off, having Hollinge make the clock for him. Drocor then finished the clock. He then had it retailed by J.W. Benson. And we have the three owners of the clock. We have Alice Hargreaves, knee little. Alice in Wonderland. And this is a very famous image of her taken by Charles Dodgson. Uh, before her marriage. Then her son Carol, Carol Hargreaves. Now, it's interesting that she named her son Carol and Lewis Carol was her friend, her childhood friend. Um, there's, there can't be no um, coincidence there. So Carol Hargreaves, as we see, uh, was, the, was, the, uh, was the next recipient of the clock. This is a lovely photograph because that's Mary Jean who the clock came to from uh, to me from so that's Carol Hargreaves with his daughter Mary Jean and then an absolutely wonderful picture here this is Alice herself with Mary Jean so that clock belonged to Alice in Wonderland it then ended up with her granddaughter Mary Jean and then to me there in 2001 Sotheby's held this single owner sale and it was entitled Lewis Carroll's Alice, the photographs, books, papers and personal effects of Alice Little and her family. This is everything that Mary Jean Hargreaves owned on her grandmother. Everything apart from one or two personal effects. The one thing she didn't want to sell was the carriage clock. So the carriage clock didn't go in the sale. She said, I couldn't do it. I, it I've, I've spoken to Vanessa since, and they said, no, the carriage clock had to stay. That wasn't going in the sale. This sale 
produced a final selling figure of over £2 million, including the auction commission, which shows the enduring interest in Alice and Wonderland. I, I'm not sure I can find it here, but her wedding ring sold for over £20,000. Just Alice in Wonderland, Alice Little's wedding ring. So there's an enduring love of Alice in Wonderland, and I must say that of the two carriage clocks, I feel honoured to own them both. I've promised my family, especially the Alice clock, that that'll go nowhere. That's going to stay within our family. And my family are pleased with that because they're not great clock people. My three sons and my, my wife, they're not that interested in clocks. They have a passing interest because I do. But the Alice Little clock, the Alice in Wonderland clock is going to stay with me and the family. So there we have it, Alfred Drocourt, two exceptional clocks uh, that we have here today to show you. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that talk, and thank you very much.